R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 33 through 35. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 33, Jackson Disappears in the Forest. When Lee rode through the fog to the front early in the morning of April 29, 1863, he found that the Federals had very quietly pushed their boats over the Rappahannock just below the mouth of Deep Run, close to the point where the second bridge had been placed on December 11. The Confederate pickets there had seen nothing and had heard nothing until the boats were actually grounding. Retreating before superior forces, the outposts had no information except that the enemy was on the Confederate side of the river and had already completed a pontoon bridge. Farther downstream, opposite the Pratt homestead, Smithfield, another Union column had attempted to cross but had been fired upon by the guards and had been delayed. The Federals were clearing the ground at this point and were throwing their bridge, which, however, they did not complete until after 11 o'clock. The troops that reached the Confederate side did not attempt to advance immediately but sheltered themselves under the bank of the river, covered by the artillery that lined the Stafford Heights. A very large supporting force was in sight on the other shore, as if waiting its turn to move forward. Everything indicated that the Federals were launching a general offensive. This view was confirmed by reports that heavy columns had been seen marching up the Rappahannock toward the Confederate left. The reasons that had prompted Lee in December not to attempt to resist the enemy in the plain along the river applied with equal weight now. Orders were given to prepare on the ridges to meet the attack, as in the first battle on that terrain. For the moment, Lee could do no more. There was no way of telling where the main blow would fall. Observing that there were no signs of any effort to place pontoons directly opposite Fredericksburg, Lee rode up the Rappahannock to see what was afoot there, but as he found no definite evidences of an attempt to force a crossing, he soon returned and conferred with Jackson on the proper dispositions. President Davis was notified and was asked to send forward any available reinforcements from the south side of the James, though Lee had no expectation that Longstreet could return to him in time for the coming battle or that any other help on a large scale could reach him speedily. Jackson's own command was ordered up from Port Royal, the artillery in the rear, around Guineas, was put on the alert and, a little later, was directed to move forward. Before noon on the 29th, Stuart reported that a force of about 14,000 infantry with six guns and some cavalry had crossed below Kelly's Ford on the upper Rappahannock and apparently was moving towards Gordonsville. Lee reasoned, from other reports, that Stoneman's cavalry would cross in the vicinity of the Warrenton Springs. These forces might readily destroy the Virginia Central and might perhaps reach Lee's supply line, the R.F. and Pete Railroad, yet Lee determined not to attempt to detach any infantry from the Army of Northern Virginia to oppose them. Convinced that he must not release any part of his small army for lengthy operations at a distance from him, he had to content himself with informing the president of the new development, with the suggestion that if troops could be found in Southside Virginia and in North Carolina, they be sent to Gordonsville. During the afternoon, a telegram arrived from Stewart announcing that he had engaged the enemy at Madden's, nine miles east of Culpeper and had captured prisoners from the V, 11, and 12 Corps of the Army of the Potomac. More than that, Stewart stated that these columns of the enemy were headed for Germana and for Ely's Ford on the Rapidan. This was news of the greatest moment. It indicated, in the first place, that the Federals had a very large force of infantry 21 miles northwest of Fredericksburg, it meant, secondly, that some or all of these men were moving to turn the left flank of the Confederate Army. For if the entire force encountered by Stuart had been making for Gordonsville, it would have been marching to the southwest and not to the southeast, into the angle between the Rappahannock and the Rapidan. Aside from the threat thus presented of a turning movement against Lee's position at Fredericksburg, there was immediate danger that if the Federals crossed at Ely's and Germanaford, they might throw themselves between Lee and Stuart and thereby deprive the army of its cavalry at a time when every road should be watched. Lee wished to prevent this, if he could. He deliberately took the chance that the enemy's horse might prey upon the railroads in his rear and ordered Stuart to rejoin the main army as soon as possible, delaying the Federals on their march. Shortly after 6.30 that afternoon, April 29, a courier arrived with a report that the Federals had crossed at Germanaford. 
On the heels of this messenger arrived another with the intelligence that the enemy was also over the Rapidan at Ely's Ford. This removed all doubt as to the direction of the advance, the roads from Ely's and from Germana met at Chancellorsville, 14 miles west of Fredericksburg. The Federals evidently were seeking to turn the flank from that direction and, presumably, to get in the rear of the Army of Northern Virginia. But in what strength? That was a question the reports from the Rapidan did not answer. If it was a small column, it could be dealt with readily, but if it was the main force of Hooker, all the troops at Fredericksburg might have to retire in order to re-establish contact with the cavalry, now presumably separated from Lee by the force marching on Chancellorsville. The larger question of where the major engagement was to be fought when the enemy had developed his plan could wait on the immediate necessity of securing the flank and getting in touch with the cavalry. The morning, Lee believed, would almost certainly find the whole of the Army of the Potomac on the south side of the Rappahannock. R. H. Anderson, commanding one of the two divisions left behind by Longstreet, had three of his brigades above Fredericksburg, guarding two of the fords. Another brigade was near at hand. The fourth had been ordered up. Lee decided to pivot the right of this division on the Rappahannock, above Fredericksburg, and to swing it back roughly at right angles to the river. This would cover his left, and would enable him to hold Chancellorsville, where the two routes of the enemy came together. This movement began at 9 p.m. on the 29th, through a drenching rain. Anderson, to whom it was entrusted, was an able officer of high courage but indolent and difficult to arouse. Lee accordingly took the precaution specifically to order Anderson to go to the front and to direct the troop movement in person. Midnight found Anderson at Chancellorsville, where he met the two brigades that had been on the extreme left at United States Ford. Meantime, Lee had ordered McClaws, commanding the other division of Longstreet, to put his troops in condition to move the next day with cooked rations if he should be needed to support Anderson. Lee did not place these two under McClaws, the senior. Instead, he took their movement in his own hands, leaving to Jackson the management of the Second Corps. The scattered condition of the army, in Lee's opinion, favored the operations of the enemy, but his disposition at the end of the day protected him against a surprise as fully as his limited strength permitted. Although he did not have all his cavalry at hand, he had not been caught wholly off his guard. The advance had come from the quarter where he had expected it. While he had as yet no adequate knowledge of the number of troops moving from the left, he held the roads of direct approach and had most of his disposable cavalry on his threatened flank. Should his expectations be at fault and the main assault be delivered against his right, Jackson was there on good ground to oppose it with the whole of his corps. Morning of the 30th saw little change on the front below Fredericksburg. Bridgeheads had been constructed during the night, and the Federals were busy digging a line of trenches to connect them, but the enemy showed no disposition to attack. So quiet was he that a deer, trapped between the opposing forces, was chased by the men of both armies and was finally captured by the Federals without the firing of a single shot. Lee himself had a touch of the malady from which he had recently suffered and he prudently counseled with Jackson in his tent. Later in the morning he rode out with Stonewall and examined the Federal lines from the ridge. Jackson was all for attacking. Lee's judgment was against it. He told Jackson he feared it was as impracticable to move against the enemy on the plain as it had been in December. The Union positions could be assaulted only at heavy loss. If the attack were not successful, it would be difficult to break off the battle under the fire of the Federal guns. However, Lee continued, with the deference he always showed in tactical matters when he had entrusted an operation to a subordinate, if Jackson thought it could be done, he would give the order. Jackson pondered and asked for time in which to study the situation. Lee consented. As Jackson went about his examination of the ground, with only a little long-range artillery practice to interrupt him, Lee turned to measures for aiding Anderson. Engineers were hurried to him to draw entrenchments and Alexander's battalion of artillery, which had come up from the rear, was sent him. President Davis was advised of the situation and was told that the enemy's object evidently was to turn the Confederate left. Nothing was heard from Anderson during the morning, but between noon and 1 p.m. a courier arrived from the 3D Virginia Cavalry announcing that the Federal infantry, who had crossed at Germana Ford, were advancing. A wagon and artillery train with heavy infantry escort was said to be across at Ely's Ford. 
These columns were moving on Chancellorsville. A little later, Anderson reported that he had been as far as Chancellorsville and had been joined by the brigades from the United States Ford. He had withdrawn to a good position east of Chancellorsville, Anderson said, and up to the time of writing had encountered only cavalry moving from the direction of Chancellorsville, but he needed reinforcements. Lee promptly sent Anderson careful and detailed orders, he was to dig in at once and, if he could do so in time, prepare a line adequate for the additional troops that Lee hoped to be able to send him. Anderson was to advise whether he desired additional artillery. In particular, he was to have his men keep two days cooked rations on their persons and was to be prepared to remove his trains at any time should the occasion demand. Cavalry was coming up, Lee explained, and must be employed in apprising Anderson of the enemy's movements while retarding as much as possible the advance of the Federals. To ensure the ready dispatch of more guns to Anderson, should they be needed, Lee halted the artillery moving up from the rear. These orders to Anderson, which were dispatched at 2.30 p.m., were of historical importance. It was the first time, in open operations, that Lee had ordered the construction of field fortifications. He had thrown up works at Fredericksburg when he thought that he might wish to hold the heights with a small force while keeping the rest of his troops for maneuver, and now he reasoned that he could increase his defensive power on the left by putting his men under cover. There was suspicion on the Fredericksburg sector that the Federals were diminishing force. Jackson, moreover, reported that he concurred in Lee's belief that an offensive on the troops below the town was impracticable. With only this scant information in hand, Lee had now to decide on his general plan. Opinion among his officers was much divided, but he studied his intelligence reports with great care and made a long-range but careful examination of the strength and movements of the Federals on the Stafford Heights. At length, he shut up his glasses. The main attack will come from above, he said. And from that moment there was no doubt in his mind. He believed the Federals on the left were in large force, and that they had advanced almost as far as he could permit them to come without getting between him and Richmond. If, as he had concluded, it was not possible to drive back the Federals below Fredericksburg and then turn with his full strength on the enemy moving against his flank, only two courses were open to him either he must retreat southward, or else he must hold his position at Fredericksburg and strike at once with the greater part of his army at the columns marching on Chancellorsville. A retreat was the easier and safer course, so far as the immediate situation was concerned. General Pope, somewhat similarly placed by Jackson's march on Manassas, had not hesitated to retire precipitately. The alternative policy, to divide the army now and to give battle on the left, was to take great risks of destruction. Defeat on the left would necessitate the evacuation of Fredericksburg, disaster at Fredericksburg would bring the Federals on that sector to his right flank and rear. Late in March Lee had argued against the evacuation of the line of the Rappahannock because, as he said, it throws open a broad margin of our frontier and renders our railroad communications more hazardous and more difficult to secure. This consideration weighed heavily with him now and inclined him to hazard a battle to hold the front on which he then stood. Besides, only 20,000 men had been employed to repulse the assaults of Burnside's whole army at Fredericksburg in December. A lesser force might suffice to beat off the attacks of the divisions huddled under the riverbank. He probably reasoned, also, that a retreat was what Hooker might reasonably anticipate. An immediate offensive against the columns advancing down the south bank of the Rappahannock might disconcert his adversary and give the Confederates the advantage of a surprise in a broken, wooded country. Lee's decision, therefore, was to prepare the army for a retreat, if that became necessary, but to retain a limited force at Fredericksburg and to strike swiftly on his left. Early's division, with one brigade from McClaws, supported by a strong force of artillery, would be held on the heights overlooking the plain where waited the federal units now identified as under command of Major General John Sedgwick. McClaws was to move at midnight to reinforce Anderson, and Jackson was to follow at daybreak, with his entire corps, less early. McClaws had already been instructed to make ready for a move, and both he and Jackson were now directed to send all the wagon trains to the rear and to provide the men with two days' rations. Jackson's mission, as set forth in orders, was to make arrangements to repulse the enemy, but Lee's purpose was, if possible, to drive the enemy back to the Rapidan. McClaws marched at midnight on April 30 to May 1. 
The forehand Jackson had his men aroused soon after that hour and was on the road, by the light of a brilliant moon, before dawn covered the earth with a thick fog. About daybreak, also, Stuart arrived at headquarters, accompanied by Major von Bork, and reported that the cavalry, after some romantic moonlight fighting, was on the flank of Anderson's column. The force of cavalry was small, only five thin regiments, for he had detached two regiments under Rooney Lee to watch Stoneman. Two regiments were a petty force with which to oppose the thundering federal columns riding hard toward the railroad, yet the main army had its eyes, and Lee no longer had to consider any difficult rearward maneuvers simply to re-establish contact with the cavalry. Instead of riding forthwith to the left, Lee prudently went back on the morning of May 1 to the old lines on the heights behind Fredericksburg. The fog was very heavy, fortunately, this time, for it limited the vision of the crew of the Federal Observation Balloon that rode high above it. Finding that the Federals were not preparing an immediate advance, Lee directed that more artillery be brought up and that no additional batteries be sent to Jackson, who would be fighting in a country where there would be little opportunity for the employment of guns. From Lee's Hill, he approved the disposition already made of the artillery and sent a battery down the Rappahannock to deal with two gunboats that were reported to be shelling Port Royal. To General Early, who was left in charge, he gave precise instructions, Early was to conceal the weakness of his numbers and was to endeavor to hold his position against attack. In case he was compelled to retreat before an overwhelming force, Early was to retire southward and was to protect the trains already moving in that direction. Should he discover that the enemy had sent away any large part of his troops, Early was to dispatch to the left as many troops as he could possibly spare, and if the enemy disappeared, Early was to move at once to rejoin the main army. With these directions and a final look at the lines, Lee started during the afternoon of May 1 to the threatened sector. He was playing a desperate game, and he knew it. He was leaving early with only about 10,000 men, including the personnel of 45 guns, and he was about to lead 51,000, of all arms, against a foe who, if he were making his major offensive, might have nearly twice that number in and around the gloomy wilderness of Spotsylvania. There was no news of any Confederate reinforcements. In a word, the weakened Army of Northern Virginia would have to rely upon itself, and itself only, to escape the jaws of the gigantic pincers that seemed to be closing upon it. Riding down the plank road, which led west from Fredericksburg to Chancellorsville, Lee joined Jackson just as the Confederate skirmishers were engaging the Federals. Together with Jackson, who was dressed in full uniform, Lee rode along the road to Zor Church amid the cheering of the troops, who saw in the presence of their favorite commanders the augury of victory. In a short time, the Federals began to give way before McClaws and Anderson, who were advancing along the Orange Turnpike and the plank roads. As Jackson had the situation well in hand, Lee soon rode off to the right to reconnoiter. He found that the enemy's left, which had not been attacked, was being drawn in along with the rest of the line. It was retiring to a front that rested on the Rappahannock close to Scott's Ford and ran thence south and southwestward. The approaches were well picketed and the troops were spread out in a tangled country of close, second-growth timber, in very truth a wilderness, broken with small streams, cut by only a few roads and almost devoid of open ground. Every road seemed swept by batteries. The terrain resembled the Chickahominy Valley, where the Seven Days Battles had been fought, except that the timber was not so large, while the swamps were small and widely scattered. Still more did it resemble, save in the absence of hills, a country that Lee never saw, but one that was to have a still more sinister name as the graveyard of tens of thousands, the Muse are gone. An attack through the somber thickets, where vision was limited to a few score yards, was out of the question. To enter the woods, in the face of an enemy who had selected and fortified his position, was to invite destruction. That was plain to Lee as he rode back to the plank road. There was something suspicious about the situation. The advance of Anderson and McClaws, which was still underway, was much too easy. The Federals seemed merely to be fighting a slow, rearguard action. Prisoners affirmed that they belonged to Meade's V Corps and that they had followed Howard's strong XI Corps across the Rapidan. The XII Corps was likewise known to have passed the river, what had happened to it, and where was Howard? Had the XI and the XII Corps taken some other road? Was it possible that Hooker, from the abundance of his manpower, was employing the V Corps to screen a great movement farther around the flank toward the R, F, and P, or westward toward Gordonsville, whither early reports had led Lee to believe that Howard was moving? 
Stewart should know, Lee, at 4 p.m., sent him a message to ask what had become of the other federal columns. After sunset, Jackson sent word that the enemy had stopped his withdrawal and had checked the Confederate advance. As far as could be ascertained, the Federals were on a line extending southwestward from the front Lee had reconnoitered to a clearing in the wilderness that bore the pretentious name of Chancellorsville, though it consisted of only one residence and its outhouses. Were these dispositions the answer to Lee's questionings? Had the Federals simply drawn back to a prepared position to await attack with their whole force? 69. To ascertain more of the ground, Lee went forward a mile and more to the southeast angle of the crossing of the Plank Road and the road that led southwestward to the Catherine Iron Furnace. It was still daylight when he joined Jackson there, and they had to retire a short distance to escape the fire of a Federal sharpshooter who, from the top of a distant tree, was trying to pick off the gunners of a Confederate battery that had halted nearby on the Plank Road. The two walked back under the cover of the pine woods and sat down on a log. Lee's first question was whether Jackson had discovered the strength and position of the enemy on Confederate left. Jackson replied that Stewart's horse artillery had just been engaged in an artillery duel in that direction and had encountered a very heavy fire. General Wright, cooperating with the horse artillery, had also found the enemy in strength in the woods. Jackson went on to explain how promptly the enemy had abandoned his advance and how easily he had been driven back to Chancellorsville. The movement was a feint or a failure, he said. The enemy would soon recross the Rappahannock. By tomorrow morning, he insisted, there will not be any of them this side of the river. Lee could not believe that this would happen. He hoped that Jackson's prediction might be realized, he said, but he thought that the main army of Hooker was in their front, and he could not persuade himself that the Federal commander would abandon his attempt so readily. Calling for Major T. M. R. Talcott and Captain J. K. Boswell, Jackson's chief engineer, he instructed them to make a careful reconnaissance of the ground. If their report was against an attack, as Lee expected it would be, then there was no alternative except to move by the left flank and to try to get in Hooker's rear, for Lee was satisfied from his reconnaissance that there were no openings on the Confederate right. While the two were speculating on this, General Stewart rode up with a report from General Fitz Lee, who was operating beyond the Confederate left. Fitz Lee had discovered that the enemy's right flank, extended west beyond Chancellorsville, was in the air, resting on no natural barrier, and therefore could be turned if it could be reached. Very little Federal horse had been encountered. The main force of cavalry had evidently gone off under Stoneman. This news, of course, improved the prospect of a turning movement beyond the Confederate left wing. Secrecy and celerity were necessary for such a bold operation, both would be promoted if no considerable force of Federal cavalry was on the flank to delay the advance or to warn the Federal infantry. But who would give information as to whether there were roads to the westward that led beyond the Union outposts, roads that were, if possible, entirely out of the enemy's sight? Stuart undertook to examine the ground and to find a guide. He soon rode off for that purpose. Before midnight, Talcott and Boswell returned to the bivouac, where Lee and Jackson were still discussing what should be done. The two engineers had reconnoitered with care and reported unequivocally against an attack in front. The enemy's position, they said, was strong, well protected by the woods and covered with an abundance of artillery. That settled the question in Lee's mind. He decided immediately against a frontal attack and resumed his conference with Jackson. How, he asked, half to himself, can we get at these people? Jackson answered, in substance, that it was for Lee to say. He would endeavor to do whatever Lee directed. Lee took his map, which showed most of the roads and, after a few minutes' study, pointed out the general direction of a movement around the Federals' right flank and to their rear. An attack must be made from the west to turn the strong Union positions around Chancellorsville so that the two wings of the army could make a united assault. Jackson at once acquiesced. General Stewart, Lee went on, will cover your movement with his cavalry. Jackson rose, smiling, and touched his cap, my troops will move at four o'clock, he said. Remembering Jackson's repeated declaration that the enemy would recross the river that night, Lee added, in effect, that if Jackson had any doubt whether the enemy was still in position the next morning, he could send a couple of guns to the point where Stuart's horse artillery had been engaged that evening and could open fire on the enemy's position. 
that would soon settle the question. Jackson was thus entrusted with the execution of the plan that Lee had determined upon. Caution and speed were urged upon him. The council then ended. Jackson retired promptly to get a few hours rest, as he would have to be up early to procure detailed information about the roads before he set his column in motion. Before Lee followed Jackson to the cold comfort of a bed on the ground, Reverend B. Teeth Lacey, a well-known chaplain in Jackson's corps, reported by order of Stewart, who had learned that Lacey had formerly had charge of a church in the neighborhood and had often traveled its byways. The minister's description of the road satisfied Lee that the movement he had ordered Jackson to make in the morning was not beyond the endurance of the troops and the horses. Relieved in mind, Lee spread out his saddle blanket at the foot of a tree, put his saddle at one end of it for a pillow, covered himself with his overcoat and lay down. He was asleep when Captain J. Pete Smith, of Jackson's staff, a young man whom Lee was fond of teasing, waked him with a report of the situation on the right, whither Lee had sent him earlier in the evening. Lee slowly sat up. Ah, Captain, he said, you have returned, have you? Come here and tell me what you have learned on the right and putting his arm around the shoulder of the bending young officer, he drew him by his side. Smith told him what he had found. Lee thanked him and then added that he regretted the young men around General Jackson had not saved him from annoyance by locating a federal battery that had been causing trouble. You young men, he said in substance, are not equal to the young men of my youth. Smith saw that the general was rallying him and he broke away from the hold Lee tried to retain on his shoulder. The general laughed heartily, a strange sound in those grim woods and among those sleeping men marked for death, and then stretched out again. Silence fell once more over the pine thicket, silence and darkness, except for the faint light of a feeble fire that a waiting courier had lighted. An hour or so passed, and then the gaunt form of Jackson stirred. He rose, spread his borrowed cape over a brother officer who lay uncovered on the ground, and went to the fire. There, in a short time, he was joined by Mr. Lacey. Jackson made place for the chaplain on a cracker box where he had found a seat and quizzed him regarding the roads. Jackson concluded that those with which Lacey was most familiar lay too close to the enemy's lines. Telling the minister to seek a more covered route, Jackson sent him off with Major Hotchkiss, his topographical engineer. After Lacey and Hotchkiss had gone off, Colonel Long of Lee's staff woke up and found Jackson alone by the fire, shivering from the chill of the morning, against which he had no overcoat to protect him. Long slipped away and contrived to get Jackson a cup of coffee from an adjacent cook camp. As the two stood talking, Jackson's sword, which was leaning against a nearby tree, fell with a clatter to the ground. Long picked it up and gave it to Jackson, who buckled it on. There was ill omen in this, as Long remembered the incident afterwards. Now the camp began to stir in the darkness. Lee woke up and joined Jackson. They discussed the roads to the left and speculated, doubtless, on what the reconnaissance of Lacey and Hotchkiss would show. Whatever was done must be done at once, because even a careless enemy could not be expected to keep his right flank uncovered long when he had no cavalry to guard it. At Fredericksburg, Sedgwick surely would attack, also, if the Federals discovered that the right flank of the Confederate army was weakened. The two generals did not have long to wait, for Lacey and Hotchkiss soon rode up. Hotchkiss picked up another cracker box, set it between Lee and Jackson and placed his map before them. He explained that a crude trail, which he had drawn on the sheet, had been cut through the woods, well to the southwest and out of sight of the enemy. This ran into a better road that led northward and beyond the enemy's right flank. The proprietor of the iron furnace, who had opened the byway through the woods, would act as guide over it, in case his services were needed. Lee had left the execution of the movement to Jackson and had not prescribed a definite route or designated how many troops were to follow it. He now turned to Stonewall, who was still studying the map. General Jackson, said he, what do you propose to do? Go around here, Jackson said, and trace the route that Hotchkiss had marked. What do you propose to make this movement with? With my whole corps, Jackson answered. That was Jackson's own conception, his major contribution to the plan. He would not attempt a simple turning movement that would merely confuse the enemy and give an opening for a general assault. 
In moving to the enemy's rear, as Lee had planned, he would march with all his 28,000 men and would attack in such force as to crumple up the enemy and throw the whole right wing back against the fords. It was a proposal Lee had not expected, and it floored him. What will you leave me, he said, in some surprise. The divisions of Anderson and McClaws, Jackson answered, unabashed. Two divisions to face an enemy who might easily have 50,000 men in a strong position. In case the enemy should learn that Jackson had been detached and should then resume the offensive at Chancellorsville and at Fredericksburg. However, the movement around the left flank to the rear of the Federals was the only means of retaining the initiative. If it were to be attempted at all, it should be undertaken in sufficient strength to roll up the enemy's rear. The boldness of the proposal stirred Lee's fighting blood, the benefit to be gained from the operation appealed to his military judgment. The thing could be done, it should be done. If Jackson could turn the flank, he would hold the line. Well, said he, calmly, go on. And as Jackson sketched his march, Lee jotted down notes for his own dispositions. It was now nearly daylight, and the dimming stars gave promise of a clear day. In the bivouacs around headquarters, the troops were eating. The hungry horses were devouring such scanty forage as the quartermasters had been able to find. The skirmishers were beginning their fire. Orders for Jackson's movement were fashioned quickly. Lee soon rode off to cover with his scant force that part of the line on the left that Jackson was about to abandon. Lee directed Posey to extend his brigade to the left and established headquarters temporarily on the side of the road to the Catherine Furnace. He was there, about 7 a.m., when the head of Jackson's column began swinging to the southwest. A short distance behind the leading regiments rode Stonewall and his staff. Jackson drew rein for a minute or two and said a few words to Lee that nobody overheard. Stonewall pointed significantly ahead. Lee nodded. Jackson rode on. Doubtless Lee's eyes followed the erect figure of Jackson. Stonewall's face was a bit flushed under the visor of the cap that was pulled far over his blue eyes. He disappeared like a Norse god in the forest. As Lee looked, it must have been with confidence, with personal affection, and with admiration. Such an executive officer, he said not many days thereafter, the sun never shone on. I have but to show him my design, and I know that if it can be done, it will be done. No need for me to send or watch him. Straight as the needle to the pull, he advanced to the execution of my purpose. Chapter 34 Fate Intervenes at Lee's High Noon The mission of Jackson was daring by every canon of war. Equally daring was the task to which Lee turned when Jackson's figure faded into the forest to the rhythm of the clanking canteens of his swiftly swinging soldiers. For Lee, defying the lesson of Sharpsburg, had divided his army into three parts, into four, if Rooney Lee's two regiments of cavalry, facing Stoneman, were counted as a separate unit. Jackson was carrying 28,000 men with him toward the right flank and rear of Hooker. Early's 10,000 were watching Sedgwick on the Fredericksburg sector, and Lee, with a scant 14,000, was left to hold off the main army of the Federals on a front of three and a quarter miles. Lee planned his dispositions quickly. Tactically and strategically, the day's work was to be his, for he had no officer with him above the rank of division commander and he was unwilling to trust either of the major generals with direction of the field. He sent back Colonel Chilton, in person, to Fredericksburg to repeat the orders of the previous day, which were for Early to hold his position, to detach troops to the Chancellorsville line if the enemy reduced force in his front, and to join Lee with his entire command if the enemy disappeared from the Fredericksburg sector. Wilcox, who was watching Banks's ford with his brigade, was similarly instructed to leave a small force there and march in support on the plank road in case the Federals showed no intention of crossing. Then Lee moved Wright's brigade of Anderson's division from the Plank Road up to the Furnace Road, where it formed on the right of Posey. The map on page 527 shows the situation at 8 a.m. on May 2. It represents not only the Confederate line but also the Federal positions, most of which were unknown at that time in detail to Lee. Orders were to hold the line, with skirmishers well out, but not to provoke attack. The guns were placed as advantageously as possible to cover the approaches, but the prospect remained one of dire danger. 
Even when Kershaw came up to fill the gap between McClaws's left and the right of Anderson, the men were six feet apart on some sections of the line. They could not possibly hold their ground against a determined attack by the powerful enemy that faced them. If the divisions of Anderson and McClaws were forced to retreat, there would be a gap between Fredericksburg and Jackson's column. If Early were driven back, Lee's rear would be exposed and Jackson might be compelled to break off his turning movement. If Jackson were repulsed, the Federals might have opportunity of destroying him and then of turning on Lee and Early. Lee was fully conscious of the risks he was taking. It is plain, he wrote in a dispatch to the president, that if the enemy is too strong for me here, I shall have to fall back, and Fredericksburg must be abandoned. If successful here, Fredericksburg will be saved and our communications retained. I may be forced back to the Orange and Alexandria or the Virginia Central Road, but in either case I will be in position to contest the enemy's advance upon Richmond. I have no expectations that any reinforcements from Longstreet or North Carolina will join me in time to aid in the contest at this point, but they may be in time for a subsequent occasion. If I had with me all my command, I should feel easy, but, as far as I can judge, the advantage of numbers and position is greatly in favor of the enemy. The morning opened quietly. Save when the skirmishers engaged angrily, or when the southern batteries on the right growled in warning as the Federals showed themselves, the early hours were such as the army might have spent during the weeks of waiting in front of Richmond, eleven months before. But what of Jackson? How was he faring on those narrow wilderness roads that lent themselves so readily to ambuscade and surprise? About ten o'clock there was a sound of artillery fire by a few guns to the westward, and at eleven this grew heavier. As noon shortened the shadows, a sudden outburst of infantry fire was audible from the vicinity of the iron furnace past which Jackson's column was moving. Soon a courier brought ominous tidings, the enemy was attacking the wagon train that was following the rear of the turning column. The possibly of frantic driving, wild confusion, and blocked roads were all conjured up by that dread phrase, the enemy in the wagon train. Jackson, of course, could be counted upon to have made some provision against disaster from such a move, because he knew that Lee could not cover his line of march. However, Posey's brigade was sent toward the threatened point, and Wright was shifted to the left to support Posey. Ere long came the reassuring news that the enemy had been beaten off, that the trains were free, and that Jackson had thrown back two brigades to cover his rear. But as Posey's skirmishers were hotly engaged, he was left where he was to assist these brigades, and an effort was made to place a gun where it would help him. As the afternoon wore on, it became apparent that Jackson had not been held up a second time on the early stages of his march. Nor had the enemy shifted troops from the line to meet him. Where visible in front of Chancellorsville, the Federals were not decreasing in force, though they seemed more numerous around Catherine Furness. On McClaws's front there was some lively firing by Wofford's brigade around 3.15, but nothing to indicate a general attack by the Federals. Just as the fusillade on Wofford's lines began to die away, a message in Jackson's autograph was delivered to Lee. It was a single sheet, scrawled in pencil and reading as follows. Near 3 p.m. May 2d, 1863. General. The enemy has made a stand at Chancellors, which is about two miles from Chancellorsville. I hope as soon as practicable to attack. I trust that an ever-kind providence will bless us with great success. See respectfully. T. J. Jackson. Lieutenant G. E. N. L. G. E. N. L. R. E. Lee. The Leech Division is up and the next two appear to be well closed. T. J. J. This was good news and bad, good because it indicated that Jackson was far around on the enemy's flank, bad because its reference to a stand by the enemy seemed to destroy all hope that the attack Jackson was about to make on the enemy could be a surprise. Until further reports came, Lee could only listen for the sound of firing. Apparently nothing had happened between the time the courier left Jackson and the time he reached headquarters, for the only echo of battle that came from the west was that of Posey's skirmishers opposite the Iron Furnace. Suspense was rising. The day was far gone. Unless Jackson's guns were soon heard, his action would have to be deferred until morning, and, being postponed, would almost certainly be discovered. Orders were issued to press the enemy as soon as Jackson opened, so as to prevent the dispatch of reinforcements to oppose him. 
The next news did not come from the West, but from the East, and was enough to make excitable men turn pale. Early had left Fredericksburg. Without firing a shot, he was marching to join Lee, the strong positions on the heights had virtually been abandoned to the enemy, to be occupied at his pleasure, the rear was open to Sedgwick. It was all due to a mistake in the transmission of ever-dangerous verbal orders. Colonel Chilton, who had not been in good spirits for some time, had reached Early's headquarters about 11 a.m. that day, and in some unaccountable fashion had confused the instructions he had been directed to deliver. He had told Early that he was to leave one brigade at Fredericksburg with artillery support and was to march at once to Lee with the rest of his command. Early had protested in vain and then obediently had drawn out his guns and had put them on the road. Lee, of course, at once wrote him to correct the misunderstanding and to leave him full discretion, but he did not know what might have happened after Early had left the heights. The only reason for hoping that the enemy had not seized the positions was that no report to that effect had been forwarded by the brigade that had been left behind. In any case, the situation was one of acutest danger. Fredericksburg was exposed to the enemy, no further news had been received from Jackson about his advance or about the stand of the enemy, night was distant, but two hours, it was a desperate moment in a desperate campaign. Yet, despite his recent illness, Lee did not show misgiving in a single doubtful word or impatient gesture. If Fredericksburg were occupied in force, or if Jackson had been balked in front of a line that had been strengthened at the news of his coming, then, but what was that rumble from the west, swelling like distant thunder above the rattle of Posey's skirmishers? Every ear was strained, every heart stopped for a moment. Then, as the fury of a cannonade swept over the wilderness, every eye brightened. It was Jackson at last, hurling his veterans desperately against the Federals to the wild music of his guns. Quickly the word was passed to the right, advance and hold the attention of the enemy, threaten him with attack, alarm him for the safety of his position. Not one man must Hooker be permitted to withdraw from his left to reinforce the right that Jackson was now crumpling up. As diligently as if engaged in a real offensive, the thin line sprang up and straightened and stiffened and began steadily to move forward. Past the picket posts it pressed, up to the Federal skirmishers, on toward the grim main position behind the felled trees in the thicket. The roads were to be covered, Lee said, and if any opening was found, the men were to make the most of it, but otherwise they were to content themselves with a demonstration and were gradually to incline to the left so as to join flanks with Jackson, if he succeeded in rolling up the enemy back on the center. As the men approached the Federal entrenchments, they could see them lined with troops, against which the Confederate batteries played. No sign was there anywhere of any evidence that the enemy sensed a bluff and was drawing men off to oppose Jackson, the sound of whose battle was rising louder and louder, in a glorious chorus. As Lee shifted to the left in a tactically flawless move, a gap was made in McClaws's division, but the 10th Georgia was deployed in its full strength as a skirmish line and so admirably performed its duty that the front seemed unbroken. Lee was nearest at the time to Mahone's brigade and personally directed its advance. Watching the situation closely, he now ordered forward three companies of the 6th Virginia to make a feint as if the whole line were about to charge. The Virginians sprang forward, rushed over a difficult abatis and entered the enemy's works a little after dark. They could remain only a short time, as the Federals quickly rallied, but when the three companies returned they brought with them the beautiful colors of the 107th Ohio Regiment, which they delivered into Lee's own hands. The demonstration had served its purpose, for in the darkness that had now settled thickly over the wilderness, the Federals could not move troops to their right in time to strengthen it. Lee ordered McClaws and Mahone back to their original lines and, with the rest of the army, listened in fascination to the swelling roar of Jackson's attack. It was evident that Jackson was advancing rapidly, but the volume of sound indicated a growing resistance. Soon the moon rose above the trees in a sky of floating clouds and vaguely illuminated the landscape, but the western horizon was covered with a fiery curtain, draped into fantastic, he said changing folds by the lighted fuses of the flying shells, a dazzling, awesome sight. Now the din diminished, now it rose again, salvos and volleys, the nervous, uneven fire of scattered, frantic batteries, the rattle of long lines of muskets. Hour after hour, the night battle continued, slowly drawing nearer and shifting southward. At eleven o'clock it was still in its fury, not until midnight did it die away into silence, like the sullen growl of an exhausted dog. 
Then, as Lee prepared to lie down in a little pine thicket with an oilcloth over him to keep off the dew, the whippoorwills began their dirge. And never were they known to sing so long and loud as they did that Saturday night at Chancellorsville. Weariness overcame the questionings of an anxious mind, and Lee went to sleep on the ground. About 2.30 he was awakened by the sound of two voices, one of them Taylor's. Who is there? Lee called. It is Captain Wilburn, Taylor answered. Lee raised himself on his elbow and pointed to his outspread blankets. Sit down here by me, Captain, and tell me about the fight last night. Captain R. E. Wilburn, who is Jackson's signal officer, was tired from hard riding and harder action, but he had to tell a tale the like of which had never been recounted in all the grim annals of America's wars. Jackson had marched straight on when the wagon train of his rear division had been attacked. After riding Lee from the vicinity of Chancellor's house, he had discovered the right flank of the Eleven Corps in the air just north of the turnpike, a mile beyond the Wilderness Church. The Federals, with their arms stacked, had been unsuspectingly cooking their supper. Not a sign had they given that they were anticipating an attack or had been warned to look for one. Jackson had then quietly extended his men in three lines on a wide front and had given the word. The bugles had sounded through the woods, and the Corps had gone forward with a demoniac yell. The startled enemy had offered brief resistance and then had fled, Jackson in full pursuit. Wilderness Church had been reached and passed, the lines had pressed more than a mile farther eastward, and then, having rolled up the whole federal flank, had been halted by darkness and by stiffened resistance. Such a victory the army had never won, but, in the confusion, Jackson had ridden forward with a few of his officers, had been fired on, and had been wounded three times in the arms. He had been carried to the rear and was under a surgeon's care. Lee had heard Wilburn without a comment or even an exclamation. At the announcement of Jackson's injuries, though Wilburn said they were only flesh wounds, he could not contain himself. He moaned audibly and, for a moment, seemed about to burst into tears. With deep feeling he said, Ah, Captain, any victory is dearly bought which deprives us of the services of General Jackson, even for a short time. Wilburn had been with Jackson when he had been shot and he began to describe how it happened and how Jackson had been borne back to the lines under heavy fire and in extreme pain. The story was more than Lee could endure. Ah, he said, with rising emotion, don't talk about it, thank God it is no worse. Then he fell silent, pondering, perhaps, the calamity the army would sustain if Jackson's wounds proved more serious than they seemed. He battled with that gloomy thought until he noticed that Wilburn was rising in the belief that Lee had ended the interview. Stopping him, he asked him to stay. I want to talk with you some more, he said and started to ask what position the troops held and who was in command. Wilburn told him that a P. Hill, as senior division commander, had taken Jackson's place, but that he, too, had been wounded slightly. Brigadier General Rhodes had then assumed command, Wilburn said, but Stewart had been summoned, as senior major general on that sector, to take charge of the Corps. The leaders, Wilburn went on, were anxious that Lee come in person to that flank. Rhodes, Lee broken emphatically, is a gallant, courageous, and energetic officer. And he asked where Stuart and Jackson were, that he might write to them. Wilburn volunteered that from what he had heard Jackson say, he thought the general had planned to seize the road to the United States Ford and to cut the enemy off from it that night or the next morning. This reference to the resumption of the battle galvanized Lee. He rose on the instant. These people must be pressed today, he said. He wrote immediately to Stuart. May 3, 1863, 3 a.m. General. It is necessary that the glorious victory thus far achieved be prosecuted with the utmost vigor and the enemy given no time to rally. As soon, therefore, as it is possible, they must be pressed so that we may unite the two wings of the army. Endeavor, therefore, to dispossess them of Chancellorsville, which will permit the union of the whole army. I shall myself proceed to join you as soon as I can make arrangements on the side, but let nothing delay the completion of the plan of driving the enemy from his rear and from his positions. I shall give orders that every effort be made on the side at daybreak to aid in the junction. In a few minutes, the general had on his boots and spurs and ordered his staff to make ready. 
With his own hands he spread out for Wilburn a breakfast from a basket some lady had sent him, and he told Wilburn to lie down and get some sleep as soon as he had finished eating. Lee had mounted when a second messenger arrived from the left in the person of Captain Jed Hotchkiss, Jackson's topographical engineer. He had other details of the battle and of the position of the troops. Lee listened to his report but would not let him tell of Jackson's wounding. I know all about it, he said, and do not wish to hear any more, it is too painful a subject. When Hotchkiss prepared to ride off, Lee gave him further instructions for Stuart. It is all important, he said in his dispatch to Stuart, that you continue pressing to the right, turning, if possible, all the fortified points, in order that we can unite both wings of the army. Keep the troops well together, and press on, on the general plan, which is to work by the right wing, turning the positions of the enemy, so as to drive him from Chancellorsville, which will again unite us. Everything will be done on this side to accomplish the same object. Try and keep the troops provisioned and together and proceed vigorously. Early was notified of what had happened and was told that the army hoped to make its victory complete that day. When Lee rode off to do battle for a junction with Jackson's corps, the situation was much confused. Stuart, Lee knew, was a mile and three-quarters northwest of him and would soon be advancing toward him. Wright and Posey, of Anderson's division, were facing west, a mile beyond the nearest point of the Confederate line held by the troops under Lee's immediate command. Stretching from the vicinity of the Plank Road, running east and northeast, was the remainder of Anderson's division and the whole of McClaws's. Their faces were toward Chancellorsville. Presumably the lines of the enemy formed a great dipper, with the handle from northeast to southwest. The sides of the dipper were east and west and the bottom to the south. But what forces the Federals had outside this dipper, between his left and Stuart's right, Lee could not tell. His position was roughly as shown on page 536. Lee now prepared to attack the eastern and the southern sides of the dipper with his own forces. He believed that if he did this and Stuart continued to press eastward, he could speedily uncover Chancellorsville and, in that way, more quickly than in any other, could unite the two wings of the army for a joint advance that would throw Hooker back against the Rappahannock. The situation, however, had changed during the night and rough work lay ahead. Perry's small brigade, which had been moved back from the line at daylight, was sent down the Catharpin Road with instructions to move around to the furnace, to fill out the Federals and to form on the extreme left of Anderson's division. Posey and Wright were to pivot on the eastern flank of Wright's brigade, were to face north, were to extend their line, and were to advance simultaneously with the rest of Anderson's division and the whole of McClaws's. The brigade commanders entrusted with this important movement knew nothing of the difficult ground through which they had to lead their troops. Their force was much too small to cover their assigned front adequately. They went to their task, however, with fine initiative, their left supported by three guns that Lee personally ordered into position. Perry cleared the ground on his part of the front. Posey engaged hotly. Wright found himself called upon with 1,600 to sweep the far-stretching tangle of woodland on a front of one mile. He wisely contracted his own line, throwing out a heavy skirmish line to connect with the brigades to right and to left, and pressed vigorously northward. Lee himself started to the left to direct the junction of Stuart's column and his own. As he approached Catherine Furness, the fury of a battle to the northwest was borne upon him. Stuart had attacked before sunrise and was pushing forward. Thanks alike to the good judgment of Stuart's acting chief of artillery, Colonel E. P. Alexander, and to a bad blunder on the part of the Federals, Stuart had been able to seize an excellent artillery position known as Hazel Grove, about 2,000 yards southwest of Chancellorsville, and had massed 30 guns there. This strong battery gave him an immediate advantage. But on the left of Stuart's command the enemy was attacking violently. Stout brigades were shaken. Regiments whose flags were covered with the bloody names of many proud victories were broken. Reinforcements had to be hurried to that part of the line until the right was almost without reserves. The center of the Second Corps was hard beset also. Its dispositions had not been tactically good. Some of the brigade commanders were fighting without knowledge of Stuart's plan or of the maneuvers of the troops to right or to left. 
From a knoll 750 yards west of Chancellorsville, known as Fairview, the best position on the entire front, the Federal artillery was pouring a murderous fire. Still Stuart's men pressed on, still their leader rode recklessly up and down the line, cheering, singing, and exhorting as if he were a cavalry colonel in the first exuberant days of the war. Was it possible that the butternut lines could sweep on and pinch off the salient at Chancellorsville? Could it be that Lee's bold plan to divide his army between Fredericksburg and the wilderness and then to divide it again in the wilderness would be crowned with an incredible victory? Or would those mass thousands of infantry, backed up by that superb artillery, dash out of the thickets in some new coup and overwhelm the scant divisions that were slowly closing in on them? As the battle raged beyond the furnace, men were carried beyond themselves and fought as if the fumes of gunpowder were a mysterious hashish that gave them the strength of madness. Rarely in the whole war did frenzy mount to wilder heights, never before had the exaltation of a common cause so completely possessed the Army of Northern Virginia that mistakes were disregarded, enfilading fire was ignored, and attacks from flanks and rear were met without a tremor and repulsed without a stampede. Above the din that the thickets seemed to amplify into a paralyzing thunder could be heard the fiendish rebel yell rolling from the end of the line, clear and defiant. And in the midst of it all, at the very climax of the battle, when failure to effect a junction of the two wings of the army might mean ruin, Lee sat calmly on his horse, conversing with a German military observer, Captain Justice Skybert. As he saw the steady advance of the lines, he wondered what those young men would do to improve themselves when the war was over, and he fell to talking with Skybert of the future education of the southern people. It may have been at this bloody moment that he sowed the seeds that were later to ripen into the resolution to devote his own life after the war to the education of youth. The Orange Plank Road pointed the way to Lexington. As Lee discussed these things with Skybert, the Confederate flags planted on the works at Fairview and then went down under a wave of blue, another furious cannonade swept the ground and again the flags went forward, again there was a federal rally and the lines gave way in confusion. From the southeast, Union troops that were withdrawing before Anderson's assault threatened the rear of the attacking force in front of Fairview. But the Confederates were following them fast. Perry's men were coming up. With one more thrust the enemy might be pushed back, the two wings of the army united, and the victory driven home. Lee rode over in person to Hazel Grove, found Archer's brigade of Stuart's command, and ordered the men forward. For 400 or 500 yards, they advanced and then halted. Again they went on, dividing on either side of the open ground in front of Fairview and disappearing in the woods. In this maneuver, the right flank of Archer established contact with the left of Perry. A continuous line was now moving forward. Quickly Lee sent word to Stuart that the junction had been formed. Soon a staff officer came back from Stuart, reporting his situation and asking for orders from Lee. I found him, wrote this officer, with our 20-gun battery, looking as calm and dignified as ever, and perfectly regardless of the shells bursting round him and the solid shot plowing up the ground in all directions. Lee was ready for the final blow, Stuart was ordered to advance with his whole command up the Orange Plank Road, McClaws and Anderson would cooperate. The line now swept on without a break. On the Confederate right, McClaws met with little opposition, for the Federals saw their fate and were withdrawing toward an inner line that was little more than a vast bridgehead covering the avenues of retreat across the Rappahannock. Mahone's task was easy. Wright, Posey, and Perry met with resistance, but soon were close to the plank road. The vigilant commander of the newly formed artillery battalions hurried their batteries to Fairview. With Lee's consent, Colonel Tom Carter added his guns to those that were racing for the eminence. Soon 25 pieces, manned by some of the best artillerists in the army, were at Fairview, with Chancellorsville in plain sight. By 10 o'clock these guns were beating a fast accompaniment for the approaching climax. The resistance to the advance of Stuart's left wing was immediately reduced. Troops facing Anderson fell back beyond the plank road. Like a wedge, the artillery at Fairview was riving the whole line. From that point the retreat of the Federals through the Chancellorsville clearing could be seen plainly, though their ordnance still stubbornly challenged the Confederate advance. The Chancellor House was breaking into flames from chance shots. The dry leaves in the woods and the abatis of the Federal defenses were afire, their smoke blending with that of the firearms. 
At intervals through the smoke, where the forest was thin, glimpses could be had of bright Confederate battle flags and shining bayonets as Anderson's men worked their way almost unopposed to the plank road. The Federal artillery fire fell off. The batteries limbered up and disappeared. Where the horses were killed, the guns were valiantly removed by hand. The blue infantry that had fought so vigorously at dawn were making for the thickets that lay between Chancellorsville and the river. Everything indicated a precipitate retreat to the fords and pontoon bridges on the Rappahannock. If all went well, the enveloping lines would tighten, the retreat would become a rout, and there would be no gunboats to stay Lee's hand, as they had ten months before on the James. Strategy and the valor of his small army had apparently achieved the impossible. The burning thickets would be the pyre of the puissant army of the Potomac. And now word came back that Chancellorsville had been taken. From Hazel Grove, Lee rode over to the Plank Road and thence eastward to the clearing, along the route the Federals had followed in their confident march from Germana Ford. Everywhere was the debris of the lost battle, wrecked caissons, dying horses, abandoned rifles, knapsacks thrown away in the flight, blankets, oilcloths, cartridge boxes. Scattered playing cards, face up, told of interrupted games. Plundered haversacks showed where hungry Confederate skirmishers had stopped in their pursuit to gulp down the ample Federal rations. And the dead, some lay where the Confederate shell had blasted them into hideous masses of flesh, some had their weapons in their hands and had fallen with their faces to the rear, others had dragged themselves back with mortal wounds and had expired by the road. Where life still lingered, there was terror in the eyes, for now the thickets were burning fiercely, and from the copses came the screams of wounded boys, crying to be saved from a death worse than that of battle. Past woods on the left of the road, Lee rode beyond Fairview, where, with elevated guns, the jubilant artillerists were firing at a distant target, retreating fragments of broken regiments. Beyond Fairview, the woods on the left gave place to the Chancellorsville clearing, in itself a paltry stake on which to gamble the lives of 125,000 men. But what a sight it was under the warm sun of that May noon. There in the center of the picture was the Chancellor House, burning as if it had been a bonfire set to celebrate the victory. Beyond it, gray and raw against the thickets, were the abandoned federal works, scarcely visible in the smoke and in the throng of men in butternut. Wright's brigade, coming up from the south, had been the first to reach the clearing, the rest of Anderson's division had quickly crowded up to the road. All of them, now, in the wild jubilation of victory, were eager to drive the enemy into the river. As Lee rode toward the Chancellor House, they recognized him. Sensing that he had fashioned their victory, they broke into the wildest demonstration they had ever made in his presence. The fierce soldiers with their faces blackened with the smoke of battle, the wounded crawling with feeble limbs from the fury of the devouring flames, all seemed possessed with a common impulse. One long, unbroken cheer, in which the feeble cry of those who lay helpless on the earth, blended with the strong voices of those who still fought, rose high above the roar of battle and hailed the presence of the victorious chief. He sat in the full realization of all that soldier's dream of triumph, and as I looked upon him, wrote one of his staff officers, in the complete fruition of the success which his genius, courage, and confidence in his army had won, I thought that it must have been from such a scene that men in ancient times rose to the dignity of gods. It was the supreme moment of his life as a soldier. The sun of his destiny was at its zenith. All that he earned by a life of self-control, all that he had received an inheritance from pioneer forebears, all that he had merited by study, by diligence, and by daring was crowded into that moment. The life of stern duty that had carried him from a West Point classroom through the mud flats of Cockspur Island, across the Pedregal to Paderna, over the passes in West Virginia, and to the brink of the Potomac at Sharpsburg, had brought him to that plane of military glory. But it was not given to this man ever to know as a Confederate soldier a single hour when the fates that had favored him in body and in mind did not threaten him with ruin. As he turned modestly from the acclaim of his troops to direct the relief of the wounded Federals in the Chancellor House, a courier placed a dispatch in his hand. He fumbled at it with gauntlet fingers and handed it Major Marshall to read to him. It was from Jackson. Nothing in it indication that Jackson had dictated the paper in the first consciousness after an operation for the amputation of the wounded left arm. In brief, soldierly phrases, Jackson expressed his congratulations on the victory and announced that he had been compelled by wounds to turn over the command of his corps to Major General A. P. Hill. 
Not for a moment had Lee forgotten his great lieutenant, but this note and the news that it had been necessary to remove the injured member shook Lee more violently than if one of the shells that were still roaring overhead had exploded under the flank of Traveller. His calm face was overcast with anguish on the instant. What was another victory if it meant that Jackson's flesh wounds were serious and that he might? Perhaps Lee would not let himself think how the wounds might terminate. With shaking voice, choked by emotion, he bade Major Marshall reply to Jackson that the victory was his, that the congratulations were due him, and that he wished he had been wounded in his stead. Quickly Marshall wrote out the message and gave it to Lee to sign. It read, General, I have just received your note, informing me that you were wounded. I cannot express my regret at the occurrence. Could I have directed events, I would have chosen for the good of the country to be disabled in your stead. I congratulate you upon the victory, which is due to your skill and energy. At the moment, the success of the operations that Lee generously credited to Jackson seemed to promise the immediate retreat of the enemy across the Rappahannock. Lee so advised the president. We have again to thank Almighty God for a great victory, he said. Speed was necessary if the victory was to be capitalized, but the troops were scattered and many of them had already been fighting since dawn. Lee felt compelled to call a temporary halt to rest the men and to organize the next stage of the offensive, which had to be conducted in one of the densest parts of the wilderness against a position of unknown strength. In the confidence of victory, the officers quickly reorganized their men, who, anxious to press on, were disposed on a long front, with Anderson thrown out on the right along the turnpike east of Chancellorsville. Then, again, as if they had not already done mischief enough in marring Lee's most spectacular victory by the wounding of Jackson, those twin conspirators against the South fate and circumstance, the Castor and Pollux of Northern success, again rode into the wilderness. Just as Lee was about to give the orders for the resumption of the attack on the bewildered Federals, Lt. Andrew L. Pitzer, of General Early's staff, reached him with news of a disaster. Before dawn that morning, the enemy had thrown a pontoon bridge across at Fredericksburg. A little later, General Sedgwick had made a demonstration below the town on Early's right. It had been easily repulsed. Then an attack had been made on the extreme right, near Dr. Taylor's, above Beck's Island. This, too, had been beaten off with the help of Wilcox's brigade, which had marched most opportunely from Banks's ford. Thereupon the enemy had assailed Mary's heights, which were very thinly held. Twice the Federals had recoiled and then, in a heavy assault, they had overwhelmed the position. Pitzer had seen them in force on top the dominating ground, and then, without waiting to communicate with Early, he had spurred on to inform Lee. The enemy, by this time, was almost certainly in Lee's rear, marching down the plank road. Fredericksburg lost, the left of Early's line turned, the main army now between Sedgwick and Hooker, this in the hour when one more blow, untroubled from the rear, had seemed to promise an overwhelming triumph. Chapter 35 Lee Loses His Right Arm Lee did not blanch at the news of the disaster at Fredericksburg. Nor did he hesitate. When a Mississippi soldier rode up a little later with another excited report, Lee simply said, We will attend to Mr. Sedgwick later. His position dictated his action. He could not strike Hooker with only a part of his army. He would not retreat. Instead, he would demonstrate against Hooker's crippled host, would hold it in the wilderness, and would detach troops immediately to join Early and to deal with Sedgwick's column. Whom should he send? Not Anderson, for he had been fighting since dawn, not any part of Jackson's corps, for it had been in desperate action two days. Obviously, McClaws must go, for his front was not in danger and his troops had not been heavily engaged, yes, and, as one of McClaws's brigades had been left at Fredericksburg, he would give him, in its place, Mahon's brigade of Anderson, which, on the 2D and on the 3D, had had little to do. This time, too, he would take no chances that orders might be delayed or misunderstood. He would deliver them in person. Riding quickly to McClaws's front, he found the general and directed him to move Kershaw's and Mahon's brigades down the plank road at once to resist the enemy's advance. As soon as they were well on their way, he ordered McClaws to follow in person with his remaining brigades, those of Wofford and Semmes. Early was notified that reinforcements were being sent to him and was directed to cooperate with McClaws in driving Sedgwick, who was believed to have with him one corps and part of another. 
the detachment of McClaws left Lee with only 36,000 to 37,000 men to face Hooker. Two brigades were reported on the move from Richmond to support him, but as Stoneman's cavalry were known still to be raiding along the lines of communication, Lee determined to hold these troops, Ransom's and Pettigrew's brigades, at Hanover Junction to guard the railroads. Establishing temporary headquarters in a little tent by the side of the Orange Plank Road, Lee now undertook to make a demonstration that would discourage Hooker from taking the offensive on the strength of the news from Fredericksburg. Lee assumed, of course, that the knowledge of the success on that sector would lead Hooker to halt the move back to the north side of the Rappahannock, but he believed he could hold him within his lines. Summoning to his tent Brigadier General R. E. Colston, who was in temporary command of Trimble's division, he gave him instructions, General, said he, I wish you to advance your division to the United States Ford Road. I expect you to meet with resistance before you come to the bend of the road. I do not want you to attack the enemy's positions, but only to feel them. Send your engineer officer with skirmishers to the front to reconnoiter and report. Don't engage seriously, but keep the enemy in check and prevent him from advancing. Move at once. It was then three o'clock, and the troops under McClaws were on their way back toward Salem Church, for miles west of Fredericksburg, a good position on which to meet an attack. Hates and Rhodes's divisions were left where they were. From headquarters, Lee now rode to the right of the line and instructed R. H. Anderson concerning his part in the game of keeping General Hooker amused. Anderson was told to move his division northward from the turnpike along the river road towards the Rappahannock. This was a very important precaution because the river road led into the old mine or mountain road, which ran southeast from Hooker's lines and joined the turnpike at Zor Church. If Anderson blocked the river road, he could threaten the enemy's communications and break up any movement undertaken down the Rappahannock from Hooker's line to form a junction with Sedgwick. By this time, in all probability, Lee had heard that Early had evacuated his positions on the ridges below Fredericksburg and had marched down the Telegraph Road. He doubtless knew, also, that Wilcox, with splendid initiative, had withdrawn from Taylor's Hill to the Plank Road and was very stubbornly resisting the advance of Sedgwick's columns. The situation, then, as he appraised it about 4 p.m., was as shown on the preceding page. It was, of course, a grave state of affairs, fraught with disaster if Lee's plans miscarried, but there is not a line in the reports to suggest that Lee viewed it otherwise than with the calmness he always displayed. The confidence neither of the commander nor of the army was shaken, when, about 5 p.m., there came the sound of a cannonade from the direction of Salem Church, followed by reports of an infantry engagement. Now, if ever, Hooker would assume the offensive, yet even on Anderson's front, where an eruption seemed most likely, the Federals did not attempt an advance. Instead, Anderson made a reconnaissance and projected an attack, though he found the day too far spent to launch it. For two hours and more the firing from the east continued. Taking it to mean that McClaws was attacking, Lee determined to develop whatever advantage McClaws might gain. He reasoned that as early was on the Telegraph Road, he was potentially on the flank of Sedgwick's columns on the Plank Road. The combined strength of Early and of McClaws should suffice to demolish Sedgwick. So, to the music of the cannonade, he wrote to Early and to McClaws outlining a plan whereby Early should come up on the enemy's left while McClaws attacked in front. It is necessary that you beat the enemy, he wrote McClaws, and I hope you will do it. Just as he had seized the initiative in dealing with Hooker by advancing toward Chancellorsville, so now Lee purposed to put Sedgwick on the defensive. The first news from McClaws's column indicated that the way had been prepared for the execution of this plan. Wilcox, who never appeared to better advantage than on that day, had made a stand at Salem Church, on the Plank Road, where he had been joined by McClaws. The Federals had come forward about 5.20, after artillery preparation. They had gained an initial advantage and had broken the front of one regiment but had been savagely repulsed. A second attack had been beaten off easily. Then Wilcox and Semmes, who was on the left, had rushed forward and had driven the enemy for nearly half a mile, retiring only when approaching darkness rendered their advance position dangerous. In the security this news afforded, Lee prepared to bivouac for the night. Sitting down at a little fire, he was soon joined by Stuart, with whom he talked of the day's developments and of the probable resumption of the battle. 
Major von Bork rode up presently and had to be told of the adventure that had befallen Captain Skybert, the Prussian observer then attached to Lee's headquarters. Skybert had gone off during the day to seek forage for the horse he was riding and at a nearby farmhouse had suddenly found himself confronted by six federal infantrymen. Pretending that he was followed by a body of cavalry, Skybert had bluffed the Union soldiers into surrender and then had marched them off and had presented them in person to Lee. The recountal of this episode was much interrupted by the arrival of dispatches, which Lee had great difficulty in reading by the dim and flickering light of the tiny fire. Von Bork slipped away and after some time returned with a box of candles. He had noticed them near the lines during the day and very daringly had gone back and had picked them up, almost under the noses of the federal skirmishers. Lee was grateful, but surmising that Von Bork had acquired them at no small risk to him, he gently rebuked him. Major, he said, I am much obliged to you, but I know where you got these candles, and you acted wrongly in exposing your life for a simple act of courtesy. Perhaps Lee remembered how another warrior in an ancient contest with the Philistines had poured out water that three mighty men had brought him from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. By the light of one of von Bork's candles, Lee read near midnight a message from McClaws, enclosing one from Early, in which that officer proposed that instead of attacking on the left of McClaws, as planned, he return to Mary's Heights, cut Sedgwick's communications with Fredericksburg and then move against the enemy in cooperation with McClaws. Lee forthwith had one of his staff officers write to McClaws approving the scheme, if practicable, but cautioning him to press the enemy and not to permit Sedgwick to concentrate on Early while that officer was between the federal commander and the Rappahannock. Then, in an atmosphere of alarms and distress, with the wounded crying out from nearby copses for water, Lee sought a little rest. What a day it had been! A lifetime had been crowded into it, the proud news of the victory on the left, the shocking report of the wounding of Jackson, the desperate advance on Chancellorsville, the triumphant hour amid the shouting troops in the burning forest, the ominous intelligence that Jackson's arm had been amputated, the announcement of the breaking of the line at Mary's Heights, the dispatch of McClaws, the battle at Salem Church, all had been crowded into the hours that had elapsed since he had been. Aroused by the arrival of Captain Wilburn in the pine thicket where the whippoorwills had been calling. When Lee took up his duties on the early morning of Tuesday, May 4, one of his first thoughts was of his wounded lieutenant. Reports were that Jackson was doing well. He had rallied from the operation, had slept, and was resting comfortably in a tent. Lee felt, however, that there still was danger of a raid by the enemy's cavalry from the direction of Ely's Ford, so he sent a guard to the vicinity of Jackson's temporary quarters and instructed the Corps surgeon, Dr. Hunter McGuire, to remove him to a place of safety at Guineas, as soon as this could be done without discomfort to the patient. Reconnaissance undertaken at daylight showed that Hooker had strengthened his position. On well-chosen ground, protected in part by streams, he had a heavy line, with abatis and ample batteries. Anderson was already preparing to feel out the enemy on the Confederate right, but Lee quickly decided that it would be a waste of life to attack with less than his entire force. To concentrate all his units, he must first dispose of Sedgwick and remove the threat against his rear. He must take no chances with this. McClaws and Early might suffice to hold Sedgwick or even to defeat him, but it was wise to adhere to the sound old fundamental of presenting a superior force at the point of attack. Hooker must be held, if possible, with the artillery and the three divisions of Jackson's Corps. Anderson should go to reinforce Early and McClaws. Scarcely had Anderson started and Haight moved up to Anderson's line when Lee received a dispatch from McClaws, in which that officer explained the details of Early's plan of a joint attack. McClaws expressed doubt as to his ability to cooperate adequately with the troops he had and asked for reinforcements. Lee replied that Anderson was marching to McClaws's support, and as the operation had now assumed magnitude, he decided to ride to the right in person to supervise it. Perhaps he was the more readily prompted to do this by his knowledge of McClaws, who as senior of the three division commanders would assume command. Lafayette McClaws was a professional soldier, careful of details and not lacking in soldierly qualities, but there was nothing daring, brilliant, or aggressive in his character. An excellent division commander when under the control of a good corps leader, he was not the type to extemporize a strategic plan in an emergency. When Lee reached the vicinity of Salem Church, he found the situation less favorable than the dispatches had indicated. 
McClaws had postponed all operations pending the arrival of Anderson and knew very little about the dispositions of the enemy. The head of Anderson's column was close at hand, but the remainder of it came up very slowly. As Lee awaited its appearance, trying to ascertain something definite about the enemy's whereabouts, his patience speedily exhausted itself. Worn by lack of sleep and exasperated by the snail-like pace of Anderson's men, he lost his temper and was in distinctly bad humor. When at last Anderson's three brigades were on the ground, Lee ordered them farther eastward to fill the gap between McClaws's right and Early's left, but the country was rolling, there were no decent roads in the direction of Anderson's advance, and his progress was slow. McClaws must have been bewildered, for he did nothing whatever. At length, with Anderson on his way, Lee rode around to Early's sector. He found him on an elevated position, in rear of Lee's hill, across Hazel Run from Alum Springs Mill. Early had a very good account to give of himself. Soon after sunrise he had marched up the telegraph road and had recovered Mary's Heights and Lee's Hill. Barksdale's brigade had been sent to the stone wall below Mary's Heights, but had not occupied the town because it had discovered a strong force there, protected by rifle pits. As far as the enemy's position could be ascertained in the broken country, Sedgwick had a line in some old Confederate gun positions stretching parallel to the Rappahannock in rear of the Heights. At right angle to the troops in this position, who were subsequently found to belong to Howe's division, the main Federal line ran slightly south of west, close to the Plank Road, and extended to McClaws's front. From that point it ran north toward Banks's ford, but how strong it was in that quarter and where it extended, nobody seemed to know. Early's plan was to advance up the high ground in rear of the heights and to turn the Federal position on the Plank Road while Anderson attacked on his left and McClaws closed in from the west. It was a plan that involved no little maneuvering over difficult terrain, but as it seemed feasible, Lee approved it and rode back toward the center. The troops there were still having much trouble in getting into position. All along the front there was uncertainty both concerning the position of the enemy and concerning the best crossings over the small streams that cut the countryside into ravines. It must have been after 2 p.m. when Lee returned to Anderson's front, and even then much time was lost in reconnaissance. Lee urged speed and did his utmost to hurry up the guns, but he could not complete the dispositions promptly. Six o'clock came before the troops were all in position, as shown on the preceding page. At last the signal guns were fired, and Early and Anderson advanced. They met with a hot resistance on some parts of the line. Hoke's brigade came up on the left of Hayes, and the two fired into each other. Wright's advance masked that of Posey and Perry and received in the open the concentrated fire of the Federal artillery and skirmishers. Kershaw and part of Wofford's brigade beat their way through thickets but did not reach the enemy. McClaws's left was scarcely engaged at all. As darkness began to fall, a heavy fog crept over the ground and slowed down the advance still more. Despite all these difficulties, the enemy was pushed back on the center and on the right. As soon as the advance had cleared the ground, Lee rode up to the Downman House, on a ridge overlooking Hazel Run. Sending for Early, he got a report concerning the advance on the right. All was well there, but if the Federals were hard-pressed, the force in Fredericksburg might attempt a diversion in Sedgwick's behalf. Early, in consequence, was directed to send two brigades to strengthen Barksdale, and with the rest of his command was to draw a line perpendicular to the Plank Road. Accumulating reports from the other brigade commanders during the course of the next hour led Lee to believe that if the enemy were vigorously and immediately assailed, he would be forced across the Rappahannock that night. If he were allowed to remain undisturbed where he was, he would entrench again during the night, would be ready to give battle the next day, and would hold up the return of the three divisions to Chancellorsville, where Hooker at any time might take the offensive. For this reason, Lee determined to push the advance in the darkness, the first time he had ever undertaken a night attack. Early was advised, McClaws was instructed about the movement of his brigades, Alexander and Hardaway were told to move guns within range of Banks's ford and to shell it. Stewart, all ears, reported during the evening that he could hear the enemy moving vehicles on the Confederate left, beyond Chancellorsville, but whether this presaged a retreat or the beginning of an attempt to turn that flank, he could not say. If it were the start of a new offensive by Hooker, then, obviously, the need of clearing the rear was greater than ever. 
When he learned of these activities on the extreme left, Lee thought of Jackson as well as of the army. He felt that the removal of Stonewall to Guineas was imperative. A messenger was hurried off to instruct Surgeon McGuire to that effect. Remembering, too, that he had recently forbidden surgeons to accompany wounded officers to the rear and thereby perhaps to neglect the soldiers on the field, he specifically ordered Dr. McGuire to go with Jackson. The prompt recovery of the commander of the 2nd Corps meant more to the army at that time than anything else. Through the night the artillery boomed away at the unseen target of Banks's ford, but in the fog the weary infantry made no progress. At daylight, when the skirmishers advanced, the bird had flown. Sedgwick was across the river. Word came soon after from Fredericksburg that the brigade of Colonel Norman J. Hall at that point had also started back over the Rappahannock, had repulsed an attack to halt its retreat, and was regaining the north bank. Its pontoon bridge had been cut loose and was slowly drifting toward the Stafford side of the stream. All was well on the Chancellorsville front. Stewart reported that a forced reconnaissance had shown the enemy in strength in his earthworks. As Stewart said nothing about any attempted advance on the part of Hooker, it was manifest that the federal commander had obligingly waited for Lee to clear his rear without interfering with his plan of operations. Lee could accordingly prepare to march again to Chancellorsville and confront Hooker. But as Sedgwick could readily return to the right bank of the river, Lee took precautions that his final blow at Hooker should not again be halted at the very moment it was poised. Early was sent back to Fredericksburg with his own division and Barksdale's brigade. The other troops were directed to start their westward march to the Chancellorsville front. The units were badly scattered, however, and were showing exhaustion. It was slow work to reconcentrate them. McClaws got away in fair time with orders to relieve Haight on Anderson's line nearest the Rappahannock. It was 4 p.m. before the roads were clear for Anderson, and as he advanced, one of the worst storms of the spring broke over his tired troops. Knight found the head of his column still one mile from Chancellorsville. The day did not seem to have been altogether wasted. In fact, though there was natural regret that Sedgwick had gotten off so easily, the situation had been restored. It was practically what it had been on the afternoon of May 3, except that there were now no Federals on the south side of the Rappahannock at Fredericksburg. Lee was free to strike again, and that was what he had hoped to make possible when he had started after Sedgwick. But he had to count his hours. If he was to attack at all, it must be quickly, for Stoneman's raiding cavalry, divided now into a number of separate columns, had cut the line of the Richmond, Fredericksburg and Potomac Railroad and had been within sight of Richmond. Even telegraphic communication with the capital had been severed. Stoneman would of course retire across the Rappahannock if Hooker did, but any long delay in sending Hooker back to his starting point would prolong Stoneman's raid and probably leave the army without food and without ammunition. The best news of the day was from Guineas. Jackson had stood the trip to that point admirably. He was in the best of spirits, his wounds were beginning to heal, and he had eaten well. All the indications were for a speedy recovery. As Lee retired on the night of the 5th, under a fly tent at Fairview, with every intention of delivering a general attack on the morning of Wednesday, May 6, his first prayer must have been one of gratitude to God for the improvement of him who was the spearhead of the army. When Hooker was given the coup de grace, and Jackson was well again, that long projected new offensive into Maryland might be started, and then. Orders were to advance the skirmishers all along the front at daybreak and to follow this with a general assault. That this would be bloody business, everyone in the army recognized, but there was no hesitation and no misgiving. If the army had been able to turn the federal right on the evening of the 2d and to break the line on the morning of the 3d, what was there to keep it from driving the enemy into the Rappahannock on the morning of the 6th? At dawn the camps were astir, the scant rations were hastily eaten, the skirmishers were sent found, the line of battle was being formed. At headquarters, Lee wrote a dispatch to the War Department, reviewed the dispositions, found all in readiness, and was on the point of giving the order for the general advance when General Pender galloped up and rushed in. His skirmishers had already moved forward, he said, but Hooker was gone. The frowning lines in the woods were empty. Why, General Pender? Lee exclaimed in amazement that nothing of this had been reported during the night. That is the way you young men always do. 
you allow those people to get away. I tell you what to do, but you don't do it. Pender could say nothing. Go after them, Lee cried, with an impatient gesture, and damage them all you can. There was no damage the advancing divisions could inflict. Hooker had thrown up the sponge. Federal troops, guns, horses, and wagons were safely over the Rappahannock. The Confederates who had gone forward in the expectation of a bitter fight spent the forenoon in succoring the enemy's wounded, in exploring the lines, in commenting on the great strength of the works, in picking up booty and stragglers, and in gazing blankly into the woods that fringed the river. Lee gave them half a day for this curious recreation, then he had them recalled and formed. Leaving a few regiments to care for the wounded, to bury the dead, and to collect the prizes of war, he started back to Fredericksburg with the main army. Over horrible roads and through a drenching rain that began before night, the troops retraced their steps to the familiar camps. The weary army had now to be refreshed, the gaps had to be filled, and officers had to be designated to replace those who had been killed or disabled. A P. Hill had already been ordered back on the 6th to the temporary direction of the 2nd Corps, for his injuries were slight, and Stuart was again with his beloved troopers. To head D. H. Hill's old division, Lee asked the immediate promotion of Brigadier General R. E. Rhodes, whose gallant leading of that command on May 2nd had been especially commended by Jackson in a message to Lee. For the command of Trimble's division, which Brigadier General R. E. Colston had handled during Trimble's convalescence, Lee asked Major General Arnold Elsey or Major General Edward Johnson if the latter were able to do field duty. Davis sent him Johnson. Fortunately for the hungry men, the repair of the railroad from Richmond was completed on the 6th or 7th, and when congratulatory orders were issued on the 7th, the men had rations as well as honors to boast. They were allowed to rest till tired muscles were content. As Lee did not anticipate an early resumption of the offensive by the badly punished enemy, he directed Longstreet not to overtax his men by haste in rejoining. One great concern that Lee felt, as he examined the depleted ranks, was for the strengthening of the cavalry and for the reinforcement of the army with new units. Stoneman's raid had been a failure, but it might be repeated. The federal, cavalry force, he wrote the president, is very large and no doubt organized for the very purpose to which it has recently been applied. Every expedition will augment their boldness and increase their means of doing us harm, as they will become better acquainted with the country and more familiar with its roads. You can see, then, how difficult it will be for us to keep up our railroad communications and prevent the inroads of the enemy's cavalry. If I could get two good divisions of cavalry, I should feel as if we ought to resist the three of the enemy. As for infantry, Lee urged that troops be brought from the departments of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, where he did not believe more soldiers would be needed during the summer months than would be required to man the water batteries. This, of course, raised the question of the proper employment of their commander, General Beauregard. With no flourish of words, and writing as if he himself could be replaced after his greatest victory as readily as any subaltern, Lee proposed that Beauregard be brought to the Army of Northern Virginia and put in command of it. But there was a more immediate concern than for the increase of the cavalry or the reinforcement of the infantry. One of Jackson's chaplains, Rev. B. T. Lacey, came to headquarters during the morning of the 7th on his way to find Dr. S. B. Morrison, Early's chief surgeon, whom Dr. McGuire desired in consultation. Jackson was worse, Mr. Lacey said. He had done very well on the 6th except for slight nausea, but at dawn Dr. McGuire had found unmistakable symptoms of pneumonia. There was fear, for the first time, that his illness might be fatal. Lee would not admit the possibility of such an outcome. His own faith in God was so complete that he did not believe heaven would deprive the South of a man whose services were essential to victory. He said to Lacey, Give, Jackson, my affectionate regards, and tell him to make haste and get well, and come back to me as soon as he can. He has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. What would become of the army if Jackson died? Where, among all his lieutenants, could Lee look for another man to execute with swift certainty the flank marches he so much employed in his strategy? Longstreet was a fine fighter, once the issue was drawn, but Longstreet was slow and contentious, always arguing for his own plan, even to the last minute, whereas Jackson, after advancing his own proposals, would execute Lee's orders as readily as if they were his own. 
In the Army of Northern Virginia, he had no peer. For him to die would be in very truth for Lee to lose his right arm. That evening Jackson was reported better. The pneumonia did not seem to be filling the lung. But the next morning, Friday, May 8, as Lee went about the routine duties of the day, gloom settled again. Jackson was weaker, the pneumonia was advancing, he was in mild delirium at intervals, babbling orders and, with his old concern for the welfare of his men, repeatedly calling, tell Major Hawks to send forward provisions for the troops. Despite these ominous symptoms, Lee would not give him up. Jackson could not die, he kept telling himself. He was unable to go to Jackson, both because he could not trust his emotions and because there was no one in whose hands he would feel safe in leaving the army. He had even been compelled to ask the president to come to headquarters for the discussion of important military questions inasmuch as he felt that his own presence there was essential. There was one thing, only one, that he could do for Jackson. That was to pray for him. On Saturday night, as the doctors shook their heads and expressed the fear that the outlook was hopeless, Lee went down spiritually to the brook Jabbok and, like Jacob, wrestled with the angel. Never in his life had he prayed with so much agony of spirit. While the army slept and Jackson in his stupor fought his battles over, Lee on his knees implored heaven to grant to his country the mercy of the deliverance of Jackson from death. When the troops began to gather for worship during the forenoon of the next day, a beautiful Sabbath that the commanding general had recommended as a day of thanksgiving for the victory, Lee was still unconvinced that Jackson would be taken. Eagerly he met the chaplain who came from Guineas at Jackson's request to preach at headquarters. The face of the clergyman told his story, the doctors ahead given Jackson up and did not believe he could survive, except by a miracle. He was in virtual coma, breathing very badly, and muttering still of his warring. A. P. Hill, he was saying, prepare for action. And again, I must find out whether there is high ground between Chancellorsville and the river, push up the columns, hasten the columns. Even in the face of this, Lee refused to believe it could happen. Surely, General Jackson must recover, he said, in a shaken voice. God will not take him from us, now that we need him so much. Surely he will be spared to us, in answer to the many prayers which are offered for him. The minister preached to a large company of officers and to a multitude of men who had escaped the fangs of death in the wilderness, but it is doubtful if Lee heard much that the earnest and eloquent Mr. Lacey had to say. His mind was at guineas, with Jackson, and so were his prayers. When the service was over, Lee spoke again to the chaplain, When you return, I trust you will find him better. When a suitable occasion offers, give him my love, and tell him that I wrestled in prayer for him last night, as I never prayed, I believe, for myself. And he had to turn abruptly away to conceal his emotion. Going to his headquarters tent, Lee found that his staff officers had just completed decoding an important dispatch from the War Department, which had been garbled in transmission. It was an argument for sending Pickett's division to Vicksburg as a reinforcement to General Pemberton. In Lee's eyes, the proposal represented a choice between holding Virginia and holding the line of the Mississippi, and he so advised Seddon by telegraph. Then he wrote a fuller answer, to be transmitted by mail. In this letter, he mentioned the possibility that if the Army of Northern Virginia were weakened he might be compelled to withdraw into the defenses around Richmond. Perhaps that familiar phrase, the Richmond defenses, set up a chain of memories in his mind, Jackson gaunt and exhausted in the swamps around Richmond, bewildered and taciturn, then the fiery zeal with which it transformed Jackson had urged an immediate advance on Pope after Lee had joined him at Gordonsville from Richmond, the start of the foot cavalry that August afternoon on the dusty road from Jeffersonton to Thoroughfare Gap, the light that shone in Jackson's eyes when he came over to. Welcome the following army that Homeric day at Groveton, the heart-stirring sight of his hurrying bayonets over the ridge at Sharpsburg when the army would have been lost without him, the confidence with which he had met Longstreet's awkward jests while the fog was disappearing from the plains of the Rappahannock in December, that last glimpse of him as he sat in silhouette against the background of his marching men on that narrow road in the wilderness. How gloriously Stonewall had redeemed the seven days and how much remained for him to do. If Jackson's dauntless will triumphed over the doctor's dark predictions as it had over the might of the enemy, then the army might take up anew the offensive that had been abandoned at South Mountain. Jackson would not be delayed the next time at Harper's Ferry. 
The fear of his name would cause the enemy to evacuate it, then he, the fast-moving, the sure-visioned, would reach Harrisburg and destroy the railroad bridge that linked east and west, the march might next be made to Philadelphia, and… There was a stir outside the tent, a moment of hesitation, and then someone brought in a bit of folded paper. It contained the brief and dreadful news. In the little cottage at Guineas, Jackson had roused from his restless sleep and had struggled to speak. His mind had been wandering far, who knows how far? But with an effort, in his even, low voice, he had said, let us pass over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. And then, as so often on marches into the unknown, he had led the way.